So our final panel session today will discuss the perspectives and priorities and what's to come for global rail industry in the next decade. Following our earlier sessions where we have learned that definition of mobility is ever-changing, we hope that this session will sum up the key strategies and priorities that will be impacting the public transportation industry in the next 10 years. So I'm pleased to invite Mr. Kwok Yu Chen, partner Christopher Lee and Christopher and Lee Ong to the stage to moderate the session. Mr. Kwok will be joined by Ms. Chie Shimizu, partner Western Williamson and Partners from Australia. Mr. Mohamed Mezgani, Secretary General, International Association of Public Transport, UITP. Mr. Tokel Pattinson, board member of JR Central from Japan. And finally, Mr. Neil Robertson, CEO, National Skills Academy for Rail from the UK. Yu Chen, session is yours. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, you're all still awake, yes? <laughs> Everyone's uh, presumably anxiously waiting for Tansri Rafida Aziz to attend. That's why you're all here, right? I'm just joking. I, I had the, the pleasure of um, listening through all the talks and sessions this morning and I think you know it's going to be a tough sell because you know the session just before this was so real um, and so um, practical uh, you know this session I think notwithstanding the, the extremely uh, sterling panel that we have guys we've got our work cut out for ourselves now on that note perhaps allow me to set the tone for this panel's session by 2050 the world's population is expected to exceed 9.8 billion people, of which 70% will be in urban areas. And if we cannot address the problem of transportation, rail in particular, it is going to be, you know, suffice to say, even more challenging uh, to accommodate and house urban development. So really, what does the future hold? Now, on that note, you know, we are very fortunate today uh, to have uh, a distinguished panel of speakers with us. Uh, we have um, Chi, who is from Australia. Um, I'm just going to give a, big a very quick background, even though I know we're a bit of uh, short on time, but she's a partner at Williamson Partners in Australia. Uh, she was the finalist at the European Union in Construction, Best Woman in Rail category uh, last year. Uh, we have um, Mohammed, who is the Secretary General of the International Association of Public Transport. He was in charge of actions aiming at identifying and evaluating transport energy efficiency in projects amongst the many, many other exciting matters and policy decisions that he's a part of. We have uh, Tokel, who is the Vice Chairman of the International High Speed Rail Association and a board member of JR Central Japan. Uh, and of course, we have uh, Neil Robertson, who is a Scotsman who is in charge of uh, training and very much uh, the skills workshop for rail companies. So the idea or the flow for today's session really is to uh, invite Tokel to give us a view on the upcoming high-speed rail projects around the world. Uh, we will then have, I guess, Mohammed give us an overview of the benefits and importance uh, of mass public transport uh, and the development of sustainable cities. We then uh, invite Che, che to uh, give us an idea of what the future of rail designs will look like. And last but not least, uh, Neil uh, will tell us or give us an insight as to the training and education required for the workforce of the future. Tokel, please. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I thought I'd start out by just saying that I probably am the, if not the only one of the real grandfathers in the room. I have uh, six grandchildren. I'm very thrilled to be here. I'm an American. You can tell by the way I talk. Uh, but I live in Tokyo, uh, Japan. And I'm thrilled, and I, I don't see where Natasha went off to, but I really appreciate the fact that she invited me to be here today. Uh, I want to just talk for a second before I start my slides about uh, my diversity journey. I started 
uh, more than 40 years ago at an all-male boys' school called Annapolis. It was the Naval Academy, and I was the last class that didn't have any women in the school. And then uh, I found myself 15 years later being the executive officer on a ship in the Navy where 40% of the crew were women. And it was a steep learning curve at that time, and now we have women that are admirals running things. And then much later, I was at the White House, and I worked for Condoleezza Rice. And, uh, and that was a good learning experience as well. Uh, and that brings me up to date now to this morning when Alexandra Hall asked the question to us, to the panel, about should women be like men or should women be themselves or something like that. And, the, and that was the question. I thought it was a really real question and, and very sincere question. And I have to tell you that in my beginning experience, I always thought that the good woman was the one that was like a man. And, uh, but I really learned by the time I be went to Raytheon Company, the CEO of Raytheon Missile Company, uh, Louisa Franconi, was a woman, and she taught us all about diversity, and she really taught us the value of having a woman's opinion as a woman. So I urge you in response to Alexandra's question that women should be themselves in those meetings with the men. And don't try to be like a man or walk like a man, but be the, be the woman that you are, be the person that you are, because what I've learned is, as was mentioned earlier, the value of the organization goes up with the more diversity of opinion that you have. Uh, and now for my presentation, this is the International High Speed Rail Association, but uh, you've been reading that, I think. But what's unique about these pictures here? These are our board members. And can you tell me something unique about it? Uh, there's no women in those pictures. So I'm really embarrassed. And I also have to say that I am the diversity of, I'm on the board of Central Japan Railway Company. Uh, I'm an outside board member. But I am the diversity because I'm not a Japanese man. And um, this is very embarrassing. We have 17% of our company are women. Uh, most of those 17% are train drivers or station uh, work in the station. Some of them are station masters. But uh, in the management echelons, uh, the answer is, uh, well, we just started bringing women in in 1989, so pretty soon they'll be old enough to become executive. So in Japan, old enough to be executive means 55 years old. So they have a while to go. Uh, Oops, down. One more. Uh, this is a state of high-speed rail around the world. Lots of people are doing very good things. I'm going to go through uh, several of the projects. They're not all of the projects that are current, but there are many of them, and give you a little bit of an update. But I want to really focus on one thing. Uh, at the bottom of the first slide, if I can go back, I apologize. Um, it's not just transportation, it's transformation. If there's one thing you remember from what I say today, please remember that. We're not talking about transportation. Everybody gets caught up in, oh, it's a transportation solution, and we have alternatives to transportation. Transportation is expensive. High-speed rail is really expensive. If you pr price a project based on thinking of it as a transportation project, you won't get the whole impact, and you'll miss on how to pay for it and how to value it. And that's the key point I'd like you to remember here. How do you value these transportation projects in the face of their costs? So there's a lot of experts here from the UK, so I apologize. HS2, what I'd like to say about HS2, the most, what moves me about this I don't get to London very often, but I was there earlier this year. I had a chance to meet Neil there, uh, thinking about this project. And in the midst of all the politics there, Brexit it was the big issue there. Uh, I don't think it would have happened if they would have had a high-speed rail that they started construction in Manchester or Leeds and started construction there, worked south. Because what was the Brexit about was the disconnectivity between the north and the south and the value added. So if you're, this is part of the transformation. 
you, could ha you wouldn't have had Brexit if the people in the North felt like they were connected to the wealth of the South. Uh, Northeast Maglev, this is a project I helped start. Uh, Washington DC to New York in an hour using superconducting maglev technology. This project is moving ahead slowly, but it is going through its EIS. It has government, federal government money. And we're all waiting for President Trump to start his billion dollar, trillion dollar infrastructure plan. And we waited and we waited and we waited and we're still waiting. And no trillion dollar infrastructure plan, but the Congress, US Congress is funding this to start. So Washington DC to Baltimore, if you've been there, you know it takes an hour to drive it. It'll be able to go there in 12 minutes. With a stop at BWI, uh, you can get, without a stop in BWI, 12 minutes with a stop in BW, at BWI 15. Uh, BWI to downtown DC, uh, eight minutes. And this is a game changer for DC. It takes 40 minutes to get out to Dulles and, uh, and then to New York in an hour. Next, Dallas to Houston. Uh, the world economy is going to be based on city pairs. We'll talk more about this. Uh, not city pairs, but regional economies based on cities. Uh, we'll get to talk more about it when we get to Malaysia and Singapore. But Dallas, Houston, they're separate, they're separate entities, but they're basically the energy hub, the energy uh, node in the, in the world right now. A lot of people are, are uh, investing there, and that's where all the business hub is. Connecting Dallas, Houston will be uh, a big boon to that area. Sydney, Melbourne. Sydney to Melbourne, very interesting place. What is the Australia's brand? Australia's brand right now is resources. What's Australia's brand going to be in the future? It's going to be services. Where are the services in Australia? Huge country, size of the United States, continental United States. 80% of all the economies in the southeast corner down there, Sydney to Melbourne unifying that. Right now they're playing Australian rules versus rugby football. Uh, they're not unified together and high-speed rail would do the job for them and it would actually help their global competitiveness. Tokyo, everybody thinks it's, uh, you know, 50 years old, uh, 60, 55 year old bullet trains. Some of the technology is old, but the, the technology keeps going and going and going and growing. Last week I rode on a train 350 kilometers per hour. Uh, they're going to be introduced in service next year. And then we have several projects that are still under construction, that are now under construction today. Uh, this is the newest Maglev project. It's under construction now. It'll take you from Nagoya to Tokyo in 40 minutes. How many of you have ridden the bullet train in, in Japan between Nagoya and Tokyo? It takes 95 minutes. So this will take 40 minutes. It's the largest project ever undertaken by a private company, no government money, $60 billion project, and uh, through mountains, 85% tunneled, amazing effort. And hopefully it'll, you'll be able to ride it in 2027. And then the government's loaning us some money to make sure we get it to Osaka. Uh, and then you'll have Tokyo to Osaka in about an hour and seven minutes in the future. India, Ahmedabad to Mumbai. Most people have never heard of Ahmedabad. That route is a great corridor. A lot of people travel between those two city pairs. Uh, India is the only country, the only large country that's going to be growing at over 6% a year for the next foreseeable future, 10 to 20 years. It's a country that people should be really investing in. It's going to be a high-speed rail transportation metro mecca. It's going to be the most advanced country in this, probably by, I guess, you know, some people tell me much shorter time frame, but 20 years from now, 30 years from now, India is going to be really amazing. And uh, now, if you're interested in helping India, now is a great time to get in and do that. Now, your project here. I, I'm really excited about this project. You think about uh, this transformational effect. Why is the reason, what is the purpose for doing this project? Why do we have uh, high-speed rail? There's planes every, uh, multiple planes every hour flying between the two. You've got great bus service, very cheap. 
But what does high-speed rail do? High-speed rail allows you to connect these two viable city pairs with frequent service and carrying lots of people. So right now, a lot of people fly back and forth. A lot of people take the bus. But with a high-speed train that can carry 1,000 people on the train or 800 people on the train, and you can have one train every 10 minutes. In Japan, at rush hour, they go every four minutes, bullet trains with 1,300 people on them. Here, you can leave every 10 minutes or so with 500 to 800 people on them. That enormous amount of travel time, also high-speed rail, as opposed to airplanes, you can stop in between. The next routes for this, the stations and the alignment for this is not yet set. A lot of people are still working on it, as you all know better than me. But the transform transformative effect this will have of unifying the Singapore and Malaysian economy is the reason that people will spend billions of dollars to do this. My proposition is that Singapore and KL are too small by themselves. They cannot compete globally by themselves. You need about 10 to 20 million people to be globally competitive. In the United States, we have a city called Chicago. Chicago is the number two or three largest city in the United States. There used to be two other cities that thought they were Chicago. One is called St. Louis, and one is called Detroit. They're not far from Chicago. They're in really bad shape economically. And we're paying billions of dollars to try to make those two cities great. If those two cities would become part of Chicago, they would also be as great as Chicago. And the way to make them part of Chicago is to have a high-speed train between the two of them that you can get there within about an hour uh, and one train every 10 minutes. Then you're part of that economy. With Singapore and Malaysia together as one economy, one economic region, your economic viability for the future, competitiveness for the future, goes up exponentially. So the investment, back to the beginning point, it's not transportation, it's transformation. The investment that you put in in building this expensive high-speed rail system is worth it because you're investing in the future of your country and the future of Singapore. And together, you will be a dynamic region, an economy that can compete with Japan, Inc., China, Inc., and India. So. Good luck, and I know it will be built. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tokel. That was much appreciated and on time. <laughs> Mohammed, could I please invite you for your views on you know, policy and what the future looks like? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, all of you. I'm very happy to, to be here in Malaysia. It's my first time, and uh, I hope not the last time. And. Uh, it's, it's, I would like to thank, uh, to thank Natasha also for inviting me, and uh, she is very active in UITP, and I'm very happy that we have this opportunity to, to support what she is doing here in, uh, in Malaysia and to support women in rail in Malaysia. And speaking about women, um, I, I, actually I was born in Tunisia, and I, uh, I was very lucky because I was born after five sisters, and they were for me a model. They succeeded their personal life, their professional life, and they inspired me in, in, my, in, my, in my life. Uh, I, uh, 30 years ago, we had, uh, I was studying in the, uh, in the engineering school in Tunis, and we had visiting professors from the uh, Polytechnic School of Lausanne in Switzerland. And they came to, uh, for one week on transportation. And it was my, my initiation, I would say, uh, in the transportation field, so I followed that week, and at the end of the week, I said I want to study transportation. So I moved to Paris, and I, I uh, studied the transportation, master in transportation, and from since then, I have been working my whole 30 years in the in, pub in transport, and especially in public transport. Uh, and I would say I have never had any career plan. I have uh, never thought about what I want to do after five years, after 10 years. The only thing is that I wanted to do something I love. So I was uh, guided by this principle and seizing opportunities based on, 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 what, on, on uh, following uh, my feeling and following 
my, my, my uh, yeah, guided by love, I would say. So uh, doing something I love. And uh, I'm here 30 years later, I would say, uh, in, in public transportation. So I love public transportation. I'm passionate about it. And, uh, and I don't regret, regret any of the choices I have, I have made. Uh, public transportation is an investment. It's not a cost. And this is something because uh, a lot of uh, a lot of we, we we read a lot of uh, a lot of articles uh, about the problems created by public transportation. Uh, we, uh, uh, so we we often see only only the challenges, and we don't see what public transportation can bring to the society, to the economy, to the environment. And this is what I would like to to share with you. So one word about UITP. UITP is the uh, is the International Association of Public Transport. So we. We gather all stakeholders, all the public transport operators, the authorities, the regulators, the supplying industry. So we have 1,700 members in 100 countries, uh, and we have 17 offices. The headquarters is in Brussels, and we have 17 offices. Uh, and the UITP is a very old organization. It was born in 1885 uh, in Belgium. So this is uh, where we are. Uh, and uh, the, we, we have offices on all continents. We, uh, we advocate public transport and sustainable mobility, of course. We engage with uh, politicians, with international organizations to promote the benefits of public transport. We are a center of knowledge. We organize a lot of training programs. We have uh, committees, working groups on different topics related to transport. And of course, a network. We've offered the platform uh, for people to network and develop their business. Uh, one, uh, yes, uh, one, two initiatives that really are linked to what we are discussing here. First is uh, the initiative called PT for Me, Public Transport for Me. This is about uh, women in public transport, women as uh, travelers, and we try to, uh, to, 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 to make it clear that women have uh, specific needs in terms of safety, for example, and that our members, the operators, they have to consider these needs when developing their systems, but also women as uh, uh, employees, as a staff in the public transport sector. You know that 50% of, uh, of the travelers, or more than 50% of the travelers are women, but only 17% of those working in public transport are women. So it's important that we, we, we grow the, uh, the, uh, the uh, the, the share of women in, uh, in public transport to, because they, they, they can better, let's say, answer the expectations of the, of the travelers. But also, we work with the young people and we have a foundation called Youth for Public Transport, and I am happy that there are so many young people here in this room, uh, where we try also to, to promote public transport uh, to the young people and also to, to involve young people in developing public transport. So I said public, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, we are here about rail, of course, and uh, the, the development of rail systems in the world is, is, is very rapid. Uh, we have 76, uh, 76 new metro systems opened since 2000, and, and it is growing uh, uh, fast, and you have here some, uh, some uh, figures. Uh, I would like to... Yes, the same for light rail systems, 150 new uh, light rail systems opened since 85 and one, 110 since 2000, so it's also a very fast development. So public transport is an investment, not a cost. First, public transport empowers the economy. When we invest one dollar in public transport, it creates four dollars. It generates four dollars in the local economy. You have the example of Geneva here. When they, created, when they create one job in public transport, uh, it leads to uh, more than three additional jobs in the, in the, in the uh, uh, local uh, economy. And not to mention also, not to forget that public transport in most cities is the first employer. In Amsterdam, in Hamburg, in Vienna, it's the first employer uh, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the city. Public transport, of course, has a very positive impact on congestion and alleviates uh, congestion. And you see here the example of Delhi, where the, uh, the, 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 the time uh, was shortened uh, by travel time was shortened by 50 percent uh, in uh, by traveling in uh, by by metro compared to the to using a car. Public transport, of course, is uh, is uh, 
is a mode for everyone, so it's uh, it, 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 it's it's uh, it's it's uh, a way also it. It's a way for social inclusion, I would say. Uh, so, and uh, and it's, it brings everyone everywhere. Uh, uh, we are we, we, we cannot we cannot uh, build the transport system in a city by only. Um, I mean, we have to, 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 to think about providing a system that could be used by everyone. And this is a very. It's only a public transport that can do that. Uh, private cars or uh, or bikes or uh, they are not they cannot be used by everyone or cannot be af uh, affordable for everyone and uh, it's by public transport that we can answer the expectations of of, of everyone. Of course, public transport uh, is is a clean mode of transport. We have to take into consideration the emissions per passenger and per kilometer, and you will see that public transport is three to four times. Uh, uh, consuming three to four times less energy than uh, than cars. Uh, you have the example here of uh, the BRT system in uh, Johannesburg in South Africa, and the number uh, of uh, uh, and the percentage of, of CO2 saved uh, with the introduction of the BRT, which is 15 percent, uh, um, wh which is about 1.6 million tons of CO2 by 2020, uh, thanks to a, a model shift of 15 percent of people who will move from cars to public transport. Public transport, of course, improves road safety. Uh, uh, buses are four times less, uh, less uh, as four times safer, sorry, than cars. Uh, light rail is six times safer, and metro ten times safer if we consider the number of accidents per uh, passengers, of course. And, uh, and you see here the example of the BRT system in Bogota with the reduction in number of injuries and, uh, and fatalities. And, of course, public transport increases the economic value. You see the example here of in USA that home values performed 42% better than uh, when located near high-frequency public transport uh, systems. So the, the land, the value of land increases, the value of real estate increases, and it's important also that we try to capture part of this value to fund public transport systems. And you, you have another example of hotels in cities with direct access to airports raise 11% more revenue per room than hotels in those cities without. So when we have a, a, a train connection to the airport, you can raise more, more revenues in, the, in, 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 in hotels. And the impact on health, of course, and you see this chart showing the uh, relationship between obesity and the combined use of walking, cycling, and public transport. And you see the, the countries where the use of public transport, walking and cycling, is high, the rate of obesity is, is lower. So that's a di direct impact on, on health. So, of course, I was uh, mentioning the benefits of public transport, but we, we, we cannot uh, consider public transport separately from the rest of the uh, uh, traffic and the mobility system. And there are three main pillars uh, if we want to uh, deploy uh, a balanced mobility system. First, sorry, is to encourage integration between land use and transport planning by shortening, uh, uh, trying to shorten travel distances by developing, uh, developing uh, workplaces, uh, housing around the stations, uh, uh, same for, 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 for shopping places as well. So it's important that uh, we have uh, public transport as a backbone in the city and developing the city around public transport. This is one way to integrate land use and, and transport. Then to control car traffic and parking. That's important. It's a, it's a, uh, uh, we have many, uh, I mean, we have uh, uh, many examples of, of uh, road pricing, congestion charging, parking management that will uh, uh, restrict uh, car traffic. But if we do that, we have to offer an alternative. And this alternative is by developing sustainable travel options. First, walking, because this is the priority. It should be the priority in our cities. Uh, safe walking uh, conditions, uh, cycling, public transport, shared transport, uh, everything which is not the individual use of, of cars. And this only by balancing all this, uh, 
this mode that we can uh, that we can have uh, uh, an mobility uh, sustainable uh, mobility system so to conclude i would say that again sorry i would say again that public transport is an investment it's not uh, it's not a cost uh, capacity building also is an investment is not a cost training is an investment and not a cost uh, and and at the end public transport is about people uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's developing and offering sustainable mobility solutions uh, to to people and i would say for especially for the young people who are have make to make choices for their career saying that working for public transport is working for people is working for the city making uh, improving the quality of life of people and and make the people happier at the end so thank you very much thank you very much mohammed <laughs> i please invite chi to share to share with us what the future of real designs and infrastructure would look like, Chi. Hello, oh, I can hear myself. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Chie Shimizu. I'm from Japan originally, but I've been living in London for 20 years. Now I moved to Australia to help uh, deliver Australian transport system uh, as an architect, as an urban designer, and a team of basically professional designing, but passionate about designing and building a future of the cities. And so I'm very honored to be here, and thank you very much for Natasha and her team to materialize this amazing event, and I'm very much honored to be um, you know, um, presenting with this uh, industry expert, a panel of people. So I'm just gonna run through, um, sort of introducing what we do, and uh, uh, here in Malaysia, we have spent four years delivering a metro here as well. But, um, so my name is Chesim, is a partner of Western Williamson Partners. And the Western Williamson Partners uh, was established about 30 years ago, back in London, uh, specialised in transport, uh, designing a, um, rail infrastructure, aviation, and also relating to transport-oriented uh, development in and around sort of London and also Europe across the world. So creating civilized city, as you can see here, is our company motto. So what we do is that we consider ourselves as a, one of the key contributors to support building great cities for now and the future. And our growing portfolio demonstrates um, successful track record of delivering high quality design, uh, design solution for metro, railway stations, and urban design to help create civilized cities around the world. So our work has been appreciated across the world, over 17 countries, and now have offices uh, in four global locations. We have recently won a Queen's Award for enterprise and international trade in recognition of our outstanding international growth. Um, I personally um, have been involved in designing and delivering over 60 underground metro and railway stations over the past 12 years. In great cities such as London, Kuala Lumpur, Sydney, and Melbourne, we are aware that it's, it is critical for industry leaders and experts and also government bodies to work together to plan for the future, uh, prepare for the future growth, and uh, grow, you know, growth of the cities and our economies. That requires a robust and adaptable transport infrastructure system to support the growth. Let me um, point out key drivers and the challenges to define the future of transport, what we believe. One is urbanization. More people live in cities. And the city's market will define and drive the nation's economies. Aging population will transform the labor market and the transport system and impact health and social care system. Technology is changing among with all the um, um, speakers that has been demonstrating. It has got huge impact and then fast growing. And innovation in technology is transforming business modes and social behaviors. Climate change together with advanced technologies, we will increasingly choose to finance more sustainable low carbon emission civic project. So we choose deliberately to, to choose so. So the question here is, what is required to, um, to create a great city? 
what it takes to become one and continue a success in being one. So I might just uh, go through, run through the um, UK and the Australia examples as a benchmark, just to kind of view uh, um, sort of through our invest well, involvement and also some transport designs. As architects and urban designers, we strive to contribute in creating civilized cities. In order to design and deliver successful cities, transport nodes such as light rail, underground, Crossrail and the interchange facilities will have to work hand in hand in generating city placemaking and transport oriented development, TOD opportunities, supported by urban design and culture, art, and co uh, commercial integrations. I think it's going backwards, but it's not going forward. <laughs> oh, there you go. Um, London's population is now 9 million, and the East forecast to be, um, well, over 10 million in 2030. So as you probably know, that London Underground has 11 lines covering over 400 kilometers and serving 270 stations across London. One of the newest additions that built in Millennium was Jubilee Line Extension where our station design in London Bridge uh, Station has been basically adopted across the, throughout the line. And we're working on Crossroad Line 1, nearly delivered, due to open at the end of this year with new, two, uh, new 10 stations, with funding envelope of 17 billion pounds, spending its entirety. Western Williamson have completed design and the delivery of two stations at Paddington and West um, Woolwich stations. Uh, both of the uh, station design was envisaged to provide urban design integrations and gave us opportunity to integrate the local heritage and the cultural context as part of our design. HS2 project has been mentioned several times, connect London to the north of England, uh, such as Manchester and Leeds. I was very excited by our peers being um, well, yeah, talking about transport in general and hearing about it, but in dedicated high speed network, we'll link um, railway, existing railway network with tube network at Euston and Aldo Common. The project is um, estimated to cost 56 billion pounds. So, as well as new station designs, historically our office has been involved in existing station upgrades for London Underground and Network Rail stations. Largest among them all would be um, London Victoria station upgrades, completed last year in May at a cost of 700 million pounds. At London Paddington station, we delivered a new station redevelopment in phases Taxi facility was relocated in order to make a space to build a new crossrail station, while also building a new LU station and a new station access and integrated public rail. New station building is enabling future oversight development. Okay. So this is the aerial view of Paddington Station. On the right of the station, there's a Crosswell station box. So the project was driven by four, four major stakeholders with a joint board set up specifically to deliver this project. Among them all is um, Crosswell, LU, London Underground, Network Rail, and TFL, Transport for London. This is a picture of taxi facility. We also designed the new canopy structure connecting new taxi facility, new LU station, and existing grade one listed station building designed by Ismart Kingdom Brunel.
Oh, there you. This is part of a new LU station box. And we use this motif, which is originated from uh, uh, the old arches, bringing into new life in new station concourse. One of the new entrants provide public realm integrating with existing, uh, this is Grand uh, Union Canal, and also leading to um, new development in the vicinity called um, Paddington Basin. So the project won two awards, RIB awards in 2015. We also designed and delivered a new crossroad Elizabeth Line. <laughs> The station where taxi facility was relocated from. This is fully integrated urban realm, bringing natural light into the concourse, which is very unusual for underground station design. Through the large span of glass canopy above, A uh, cloud index, that's, this is what it's called, was designed by American artist Spencer Finch. This is a, a cloudscape that has been printed onto the large glazed roof, making it one of the largest permanent artworks ever created in London. Maybe I'm, I'm the furthest. Uh, glass canopy brings natural light into the station. So I'd like to also talk about King's Cross and TOD. This is another good example. Maybe fourth or fifth star that actually managed to change. <laughs> Next one. That's better. The since the opening of HS1, St. Pancras International in 2007, massive progress has been made to put King's Cross on the map, delivering a vibrant new quarter of offices, homes, community facilities, schools, universities as well as host of shops, restaurants, bars and cultural venues. It was quoted that what makes King's Cross different is the determination to create an interesting place with a truly di diverse mix of use. A British jewelry designer, Theo Fennell, also quoted to say that an extraordinarily ex exciting place the hub of the capital's art education and the center of, for excellence, which will be the envy of the world. This is the image of a corridor yacht by architects, Berg Ingle Group. And Google's headquarter by Hedwig Studio. King's Cross set the ben uh, benchmark of successful urban regeneration and the TOD that combined the outcome of creating new jobs and uplifting economy and the well-being of the community. Further work is underway and we have been involved in opening up potential um, opportunities for constrained sites in and around King's Cross and St. Pancras. Yeah? Okay. So let me just conclude this. I have to skip a few slides, but so uh, let me just see. So a few other TOD examples in across London and the benchmarking Australian cities that we are working currently. And this is interesting, the pipeline diagram um, provided by um, Deloitte. Um, access um, economics is a potential um, future spend of the um, 
transport work in Australia is committed in next four years over uh, 70 billion Australian dollars. So that's another work which is Hyperloop. So we are passionate about basically um, our ambition is simple. As an architect and urban designer, we want to continue to help shape our cities responsibly and sustainably for people that live and work in them and for now and for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shi. I'm sorry to stop you short. Neil, if I could now invite you to share your thoughts on what you know, training and uh, education skill set looks like in the future. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can understand me. I'm from Scotland, so I speak funny. So I'm not, I don't have very good English. Can you understand me at the back? Yes? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now, who's, who here has heard of Scotland before? Hands up. Oh, only five of you. Okay, that's not a good start. Anybody know what Scotland is famous for? Haggis. Who said haggis? You're a genius. Well done. What else? Well done, haggis. What else? Do you know what haggis is? It's kind of a horrible thing that people eat if they're forced to. What else is Scotland famous for? Whiskey. Me and Colin and Leon. Wave Colin and Leon. We had whiskey last night and we're still here. Although Colin's lost all his hair. He had hair before he drank whiskey. So never drink whiskey because you'll lose your hair. I've got a wig, the same as Donald Trump's wig, but mine was cheaper. <coughs> now, what else is Scotland famous for? What do the men wear in Scotland? Skirts. Men wear skirts in Scotland. Who knew that? It's amazing. I've got a skirt. I wear it to women in rail events. Can you imagine? Everybody laughs. But <laughs> we also have a knife in our sock, so they don't laugh too much. I didn't wear it because I thought the knife might get me into trouble at the airport. But what people don't know is that the kilt, that's a Scottish skirt, has mysterious qualities. It allows us to see into the future. Can you imagine? You didn't know that, did you? If you wear a Scottish skirt, you can see into the future. So I thought we would do that today. See, the future's dark. <laughs> can you see that? The future's black. <laughs> but I'm not here to depress you. I'm actually here to try and cheer us up. But uh, we can't see into the future. No, that's Australia somewhere probably, or Portugal. No. Okay, we're not going to look into the future with my slides, but I can tell you about the future. The future, oh look, that's a crystal ball. That doesn't help you, that's a joke. You wear underneath, that man is wearing a Scottish skirt, okay? But he puts the crystal ball there so he can charge you money. Okay, so let's look into the future. What does the future hold? Well, a few things, data. You've heard a lot about technology today, computers, all of that stuff. Actually, that's all important, but data is more important. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can't decide, Colin said he doesn't know what he's going to be when he grows up. I'm telling you, Colin should be a data analyst. A data analyst is the most important job of the future. You can earn a fortune because of the shortage of data analysts. There is one data analyst for every 10 vacancies. And in four years' time, there'll be one data analyst for every 40 vacancies, okay? Do you know what you can earn in London as a data analyst? 100,000 pounds. That's a lot of money. So hands up all those who are going to be a data analyst in future. Colin, you have to. Yes, good. Railways. Railways will be in the future. Railways will be here. We will still need railways and we will still need people to run them. And there'll be more railways. You've seen all that from all the slides today. The number of railways is gonna go up, so the number of people working on them is gonna go up. Robots, automation. Are we worried about robots or are we excited? Hands up if you're worried about robots. T Torco is, but Torco's quite old, right? So he's, right, no, no, Torco is the future. Torkoal has got magnets. Did you ever pick up paper clips with a magnet? Have you ever done that? 
Torkoal's got magnets you can pick up a train with. You can just lift up a train. It's amazing. So Torkoal knows about the future, but don't worry about robots because for every robot, we lose 1.6 jobs. Now, that's bad for those 1.6 people, but we create three jobs if we do it right. So the challenge to Malaysia is how to do it so that you, uh, you, you, you get the future right. So this is the challenge we all have. This is the challenge for the UK. It's the challenge for Malaysia. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. First of all, something about the rail workforce, because I've got another prediction. Red is women. We are 13.4% women. That's bad, right? But that is 50% more than three years ago. So my next prediction is there'll be a lot more women in the future in the railway because like everybody here today, we are determined to do it. And we've got women in rail and that will help us. <coughs> Future's gone dark again. That's the robots. <coughs> I must be doing it wrong. So in terms of other things in the future, what else can we see in the future? A lot of the people that work in railways are old particularly in Europe. I'm not saying Mohammed and myself are old, but we both work in Europe. But uh, Leon's here, he's, he's quite old, but, but very wise, okay? Now, what happens in, in, in the UK when you, when you get old is you retire, and that leaves space for what? Young people. But we can't find young people to work in the railway. So we have to go out to schools, and we have to go out, or, or events like this. So. What we find is, when we, expl when we talk to young people, they only three out of 10, 30% will say, I'd like to work in the railway. But when we explain to them what it is, like you've heard today from all the panels, seven out of 10 want to work in the railway, every time. So that's positive. So we will have more, we will have more people in the railway and they'll be younger. And more money will be spent and we will be continue to invest and you know, railways are a career of the future. Oh, it's gone dark again. Now, let me tell you about automation. Here, the World Bank, I do a bit of work with the World Bank on this, so this is not from me, so don't worry. This is not a Scottish, this is the World Bank. So they know what they're talking about. This is about the future of automation. This is how to get good at automation. Now, this is a very brainy slide. I don't know if you can see UK is up in the top right. This is a good place to be. This means we've got good skilled people and it's a good place to do business. So Malaysia, develop skilled people and be good place to do business. Now, in my experience, I think the, uh, both of these are very high on the government's agenda for Malaysia, yeah? So that is how to win in automation. Because if you're at the bottom there, you will lose jobs because the jobs will move to where the, 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 the people who have got data scientists and a good opportunities to learn, okay? And you value education here, so you're in a good space. But this is a big project, and it tells us how to win. The most important thing that the World Bank say is reskilling. Once you learn, nobody has a job now. If you grow up, I want to be an architect. Well, probably architects, because they're magicians. You've transformed. King's Cross, right? King's Cross in London was a horrible place. Only Scottish people went there to drink whiskey. Nobody else went there. And now, it's a nice place to go. I recommend it. So architects will be there in the future because they're magicians. So what the World Bank say is that we need to keep learning. So that's depressing, right? Some people here are still at school, and they think, great, I'm going to leave school, and that's it. Tough. You're going to be learning all your lives. So get used to it. Okay? Just get used to it. Right. This is the worst slide in the world, but it tells you the future as well. It's actually a very brainy slide. It took somebody a year to, to do this. So just, be, just feel sorry for that person. Right. This is what it's going to look like to learn in the future. Okay? It took me a year to understand this slide, so I don't expect you to get it straight away. But really, learning through games. Okay? So the learning in future is going to be less dull. Sorry if any teachers here, because your teaching will be good and exciting, but in future we'll be learning on the computers. We'll be learning in virtual reality. We already train our train drivers in virtual reality, but it's really dull because we don't want them to crash. But in, other, in future we'll use that kind of technology to learn really creative, exciting things where you design things. 
yeah? And the difference between design and the, the, the learning will be almost indivisible. So you'll be learning as you design. And some of the programs that the architects use helps us with that. So my company are quite involved in trying to promote some of this in the rail industry. And the amazing thing is, it means that we don't send people from the railway to the classroom. The classroom comes to the people in the railway. And that's cheaper, which is good. Okay, what else is going to happen? Training is going to be adapted to work. So this is a challenge for those people here that are in education. Because you can't just say, here's my course, that'll do. That's no good. You will have to work your training around the needs of the workplace. Or nobody will talk to you. So this is the study. Now, this slide here took me 18 months. So don't laugh at this. Because I wait, if you laugh at this, I'll feel that I've wasted 18 months of my life. Okay? So this is how to get productive. Who here is productive? Yeah? Hands up if you're productive. Nobody here is productive. Surely somebody is. There's somebody at the back that's productive. Thank you for that. I thought somebody might be productive. Now, you're at the back because you've been dashing in and out because you've been probably solving some problems as well as being here. Right, here's how to be productive. You can't see that because it took me 18 months, so I want to keep it a secret, but I'll tell you about it, okay? The top two are about training. How to be productive is have enough people that know what they're doing. It's quite simple, really, isn't it? Know what you're doing. It's not a revolutionary idea, yet we're not very good at it. Some of the other things we should do. The guy earlier from Singapore, uh, Railways talked about Kaizen. It's a Japanese thing, actually. Torkoal invented it, but actually it's now used to make things better, learn lessons. Other things you should do is work with the companies. Government and companies work closely together to share risk, as we heard in the Jakarta example. Another example is do digital. Get more trains per hour. Torkoal's putting more trains through tunnels by using digital. We even do that in the tube. Leon was there. We've got more trains going through the Victoria line now using digital. And then lastly, think about the whole life of the thing. Don't just, don't cut corners at the start. Spend more at the start so that it lasts longer. You don't need to be a genius to work that out. So we are doing this, we are now doing this with, with, with countries and with projects all around the world. And the government were surprised. The UK government was surprised because they said, that's actually quite good. How can we get a bit of that? So we now have something in the UK called the industrial strategy. That sounds a bit grand, but remember, we're quite close to Germany, and the Germans are good at economic things, so we have to compete.